Hi, this is Dr. Carl Goldcamp. If you're interested in learning about the ketogenic diet like I was to save my own life, then this is probably the podcast for you. Eight years ago, I knew nothing about it. Six years ago, it saved my life. Three years ago, I started researching and talking with some of the authorities in the field and attending medical conferences about this to understand why and how keto so dramatically changed my and my wife's Judy's lives. The purpose of this podcast is to share our journey of discoveries with you in understanding how keto is so effective in proving so many different conditions, from obesity, epilepsy, diabetes, infertility, MS, Alzheimer's, heart disease, to name a few. So take a step away from all the hype you've probably heard and roll up your sleeves with me and join me weekly to explore this living miracle that anyone can access. We'll talk science, we'll talk food. We'll explore its history and evolution to today, which is that the sheer wonder of the ketogenic way of eating has changed untold number of lives, unlike anything before it. And in case I forget to mention it, please join our Facebook group, Keto Naturopath. Hi, this is Dr. Goldcamp, and welcome back to another episode of the Keto Naturopath. Today, we're going to talk about an entirely different subject, but as you know, all subjects tend to overlap. So what you learn from the previous three or four podcasts should help you understand this one. So this is going to be about seasonal affective disorder. Why some people get it, what to do about it. You can go pretty deep. This is a rabbit hole of a topic, but I'm not going to go down that deep. And in part, the reason I'm going over this is because I've been in the past severely affected by this. And I'll tell you what I did. And I'll tell you what I learned about those who have a predisposition that are very much affected by this. Okay, so first of all, what is it? Well, wherever you are in the northern or southern latitudes, it's in your winter, obviously. And so seasonal really refers to winter affected disorder. And so the first obvious thing, and it's very appropriate, so I'm going to talk about things to do and kind of it meshed in with why this is the case, okay? So you'll get what to do, why that is, go take action. So if you are part of people like me, and so my predisposition has been borne out long after I learned what to do, and now I do more beyond that, is my predisposition is genetic. So it doesn't mean that I, obviously my family has a predisposition for this as well, but that never really helps me understand anything. Okay, it's genetic. I mean, it doesn't, a non-answer to me. What specifically? So what specifically is that we know so far, and that I think is accurate, is the SNP, MTHFR, and that methylation intersection, as I call it. Methylation intersection. The problem with methylating throughout your body, because you have a lot of methylation reactions, so therefore you'd be under-methylated, and other people can be over-methylated as well, depending on their mutations that they have. So fast or slow, could be a problem. And therein is the rabbit hole. And to sort of say, hey, to make it seem black or white, that everybody who has these polymorphisms, MTHFR, it's a polymorphism, and there's three or four others that I could name that are pretty much glued in with this. This affects neurotransmitters. This affects uh, primarily the methylation, but the methylation is the ripple that affects a lot of other things. So there's a number of different polymorphisms of MTHFR. There is those that are more severely affected. That is, they are proteins that are made that tend to very slowly methylate. So they are the slowest methylators. And that would be the polymorphism C677T. And if you're homozygous, having it on both chromosomes, then you're slower methylator than not having it at all, or just having it on one chromosome. There's also A1298, that is another mutation that is not as slow as the one I just named, the C677T, but it also is between normal, and normal is called the wild gene. So what most people have that functions normally is called the wild, wild this, wild that, the wild gene. So it's slower than normal, but not as slow as mine. And so I'm homozygous, and my wife is homozygous. I'm the only one in the family in my family, and I have four older sisters still living, and I had an older brother. And my parents, as I figured out, were heterozygous for both those mutations. They had the, I'm going to call it the A1, 
the one I just talked about, and the C1, which is the one I have. So uh, it's really interesting to figure all that out. So I have that, but the other thing is that makes it a compounded problem is that I my blood type is type A. Now, I don't know if you know, and I'm not orienting you towards eat right for your diet, but there are certain things or certain blood types that are pretty commonly well known. It's not that esoteric. You might not know about it because it's not your field, just like I don't understand about your field. But in that field, it's pretty well known. And there's a lot of people that believe just in blood type. Oh, my blood type, I can't have this. I don't go that far. It's got to be just a few things I'll go with and until it really becomes a problem or I've seen enough clients or patients with this particular situation, I don't really buy into it. Same with mutations or genomic mutations that we've talked about before. I could chase hundreds of them. I don't chase hundreds of them. I'd say I'm really focused on, when it really comes down to it, probably under 40, but I look at about 100 and 120. So that's what I do. And even in that, there are people who that's all they do. They look at their mutations and their whole life is, I need to take this supplement or that supplement because of my mutation. I think that's a bit excessive. And also there's just not that much information out there to be that exact. When I went to medical school in Seattle, I came from New Hampshire. And you can say, well, New Hampshire's pretty far north and Seattle's even farther north. But the thing about Seattle is that not only was it far north, it's always cloudy and it's always rainy except for August and September. At least that's what the situation was for me at that point. I was there for seven years and I just remember August and September. But when you talk to people from Seattle now, they go, oh no, May to October. Well, us the world has changed that much. It was rain 10 months of the year and sometimes a lot more, a lot more. So it's cloudy and it's north and between Portland, Oregon, which is a state below, obviously, and Seattle, Washington, they have the highest population size, population-wise, lowest vitamin D in the country. So that predisposes them to a lot of issues. So here I was, type A, type A, not type A, my blood was type A, and I was homozygous for MTHFR. This is before I knew any of this. When I went to, when I went to school, it was before the internet. Sorry to say that. So things were not so easy to catch up on. And I put myself in a vitamin D deficient location. So before I went to medical school, I was not that concerned with vitamin D. It was nothing. I didn't take supplements. I just wasn't a believer in supplements. I've changed where appropriate, obviously. So I had three factors, perhaps the three biggest factors. So when, while studying, we had to do a lot of studying, it was very obvious that it was affecting me, both mostly in energy. I don't think I was down emotionally, but I was just so tired. So the first thing we did in the house that we came to own, we replaced every light bulb with a full spectrum light. So if it was a fluorescent light bulb like they were in the kitchens, they were replaced. Every light bulb from every lamp in every room was a full spectrum light. So that was that. So in the desk that I studied at, in my one small room that I studied at, I actually had seven different lights. You know, those light trees that it's a pole and it has usually three or four lights on it. So I had one on either side of my desk and then one right over my desk. So three, three, and one, seven different lights, full spectrum to really wake me up. So why do you need to do this? This has to do with melatonin. And so if you live in the dark, you're an Inuit living to the north, and your melatonin in the winter is going to be quite high. The melatonin is not just about dark, but it's pretty much about light. And you need to, for those who have such orientation, I'm not, by the way, I'm not saying the Inuits are depressed. I'm saying if we, me, Dr. Carl Goldcamp, went north, I would most certainly have this issue unless I found my full spectrum lights, is that what you need is you need dark at night when you sleep. You definitely need dark, not partially dark. You need it dark. That allows you to, one, get a good sleep, but that also turns on your melatonin. The darkness turns on your melatonin. So in the morning, when you wake up, if you're in Florida on the equator, then just look outside and there's the bright sun and you're good to go. But if you're 
not living in such a location, you need to artificially induce that bright light. And so having the bright lights when you woke up and wake up, the bright lights in that situation allowed me to study at night pretty much at any time I wanted to. It wakes you up and it shuts down the melatonin. Obviously, not having a dark room at night at other times of year can be a problem. So lights are a big deal. It was the first thing I noticed. It was really the only thing that I could deal with. I didn't know really about vitamin D. I really didn't know about uh, genetic polymorphisms. That didn't come till three or four years after I graduated the early 2000s, 2003, I started exploring that. And then blood type was just starting to become an issue to be concerned about, or at least to investigate. What is your blood type and what is your diet around that and, and so on. So anyways, with time, the three biggest factors that were quite effective in helping me cope were the full spectrum lights, 100%. You know, so you sleep in dark, but you wake up and you turn on the lights. And the, so the, I'll get to the vitamin D. Obviously, you take vitamin D3 slash K2, take them together, and then have some magnesium separately, only because it doesn't come with magnesium. But I usually use magnesium glycinate or my magnesium citrate is fine. Malite, all of those are fine. Those are chelates that you will find that will help you. Those three go together, and make vitamin D a little more synergistic. So that has a lot to do with mood. So now moving to MTHFR, first of all, you got to find out if you have it or not, and please look into that. It's not a big deal anymore. You can you know, download your data from 23andMe, as you've heard me speak before, then you can find out about it. If you have any questions, ask me, but I've talked about it enough, so it's out there, and you can even go on Google and find out for yourself. Ask me if you want my recommendations. Okay, so then you find out, what does that mean? So you find out, let's say you're me, worst case. All right, so you're a slow methylator is what they say. And so you need a little boost. So what has been determined to be effective, not necessarily more effective, but effective is getting a pre-methylated vitamin B12 and a pre-methylated folic acid. The idea being that where you're giving yourself you know, you're hopping over that enzyme, so to say. You're making it so it's automatically available. So the marketing has been so overdone. It's like, no, you need methylated this. You need methylated that. It's like this little answer that people who just come out of medical school, naturopathic medical school, think they have a leg up on. And actually, the data is not there. What the data is there about is that you need a greater supply of B12 and there's various forms of B12, by the way, and you need a greater supply of folate. And so by having more, you compensate for the slowness. So, Or you can get methylated. So I'm saying methylated isn't bad. It's just not this remarkable thing that you need to have. Most B12 now, by the way, is methylated because they don't want to be left behind. You know, once the word gets out, it's, it's better. All companies switch to that thing. And that's made by Merck, by the way, but they sell it to the supplement company, so you never know that. Not that Merck is always bad. Merck is a drug company. So now you have that. So what I I do take increased levels of B12, and so I take uh, methylated B12, I take a dental uh, B12 adenosine, and this is just part of the, that's pretty common too, if you look in the back of your supplement, riboflavin, which is B2, B6, B5. Anyway, I use it's basically call it more Bs, but with an emphasis on methylated folate and methylated B12. So that's how I treat, in essence, my polymorphism of MTHFR C677T. So, how do I treat vitamin A? There's nothing I treat vitamin A with. Vitamin A simply means, for whatever reason, it's alleged, I have no way of knowing this externally, no external data of my own. It's alleged that vitamin A people with this particular polymorphism are slower to adapt to get over SAD, are slower to adapt to having their methylation normalize. I don't know if that's true or not. It's really just too many variables to be able to know in humans. I'm sure they can do some sort of very short experiment studies in mice. That's partially relevant, but for what it's worth, 
that's the key thing. So you got your vitamin D, you got your light, and let me tell you, light makes a difference. It was a great place to learn it, by the way, it was to be in Seattle with all the cloudiness is that I could make light. And so I, it was my security. I absolutely, it was my security that I, I always knew I could go into a room. So right now I have two lamps to my left and right next to the computer that has the ability for me to cool or brighten up not only the, the intensity of the light, but the wavelength of the light. So I have it on full spectrum now. I can pull it to sunset level during the late afternoon uh, or fireside, you know, the radiant kind of orange auburn colors you get. And that has a purpose, by the way. You make that into the evening if you really want to help yourself set your circadian rhythm to get ready for um, going to bed later. Anyway, so you got that. That's a big deal. It absolutely does help. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Advocacy groups are making a difference, not just for individual patients and families. They are also shaping the healthcare landscape for all of us. But who are these people fighting for patients' rights? What strategies lead to success? And what pitfalls should be avoided? Welcome to Patient Advocacy Voices. I'm your host, Eric Racine. Join me on a journey to uncover the hidden stories of these remarkable champions for patients. If you're passionate about advocating for patients and want to accelerate your own efforts for the patients you serve, subscribe now to Patient Advocacy Voices. One thing that's not talked about, and this is basically a discovery since I've gotten into keto, this is the keto naturopath speaking, or this is the podcast that I'm talking about, is that it is very remarkable, it is very noticeable that When you drop your carbs, I'm not saying when you go into ketosis, call it nutritional ketosis, low-level ketosis, which you eventually will get to by dropping your carbs, it is an amazing additive effect. Uh, It affects transmitters, it affects inflammation, it affects, call it mental clarity. We've been over the mental clarity thing before. Um, It's a big deal. You don't have to be high fat, but just drop the carbs and learn. We've talked about this a lot. Dropping the carbs down, we have basically no carbs now. We're primarily, I hate to say just meat eaters. We've talked to you about that. Uh, But we make our special times. Like, for instance, Judy just had a birthday a little while ago, so we made her a special carbless cake and ice cream, without dairy, by the way. And it was great. But you have to make the effort to do these things if you want these kind of things. So... It is a big deal. So those would be my top ones to go to. And how? what else I would use as a tool? You either can get something like Keto Mojo, which is the ketometer and the glucometer, and do finger pricks if, if you're up to that. And I've done a lot of those. But I'm kind of, I don't know, in love with, but I kind of favor the CGM from Freestyle Libra, which is CGMs are about $1,000 a buck a piece. But Freestyle Libra is 40 bucks for a temporary cartridge you put on the back of your arm for two weeks. And to me, that's a great deal. So now, and they give you a meter. So you have this thing in the back of your arm, a little cartridge, and you have this little meter, or you can use your smartphone if it's over, if the uh, iPhone is over version six. You then can get the readout of the last, I think it's eight hours at a time. So you get to see that line. And what your objective is, is to make that line be as flat as possible. <clears throat> flat as possible that it's level. So it doesn't, you take out the spikes and you take out the troughs and you're going to find that that level-ness that you now can be aware of on a daily basis. And you can download this onto your computer so you can get your whole week of running 24-7 if you want to, which I think is a great thing. You find out what goes on with your blood sugar at night, during the day, after exercise, after eating certain foods. But anyway, your goal, regardless of what you're doing, is to level that. And I've seen it with enough people that have gone through our program. It's easy to do. First, you sort of have to figure it out. You know, you're you're saying, how has it changed before and after? And then you sort of catch on to it and you have a reproducible method to bring down that level of your CGM, which is bringing down your blood glucose. So a disclaimer with the Freestyle Libra is that because it's so cheap, it's not as accurate as these $1,000 CGMs. And it's still very useful though. So 
and how I notice this, and I found out it's true by other people afterwards, I would do correlating finger sticks for my glucometer with the Keto Mojo to see where the levels were. And initially, the CGM, and it even says it can be off as much as 20, 30 points. And so you go, well, how can it be useful if it's off that much? Well, the reason it can be useful is because they're using the market for that CGM, for Freestyle Libra, is really not people trying to get into ketosis or not people that are trying to fine tune their body as we are. It's meant for people that are severe diabetics that actually do get blood sugars way up into the 600s and down. And so 20 points off, and if you're 580 versus 600, it is an insignificant difference. Whereas 20 points, if you're at 40 and it's reading 60, well, that's a little more significant. So, but apart from that, the idea, if it's level, it's level. So the number might be off by 20, but if you use the pattern of getting it to a level, that's a big deal. That's a really big deal. So now you have blood sugar, vitamin D, find out your genomic SNPs without getting too crazy about it. And you look for, primarily it is MTHFR, but it could be MTRR and a CBS and a few others, but we'll just go with MTHFR. And you can compensate that by your methylated folate and B12 and other things I've mentioned. And the lights. And you can check your blood type. I don't know what you'd be doing for your blood type. It would just be you would be a slower adapter. You'd still have to do the same things. So isn't that interesting? The other things I found very helpful is certainly exercise, quote unquote exercise, but exercise I find HIT. So we've been through HIT, high intensity, weight resistant training, slow, you know all the parameters. You go slow to the point that you cannot continue another rep for 30 to a minute and a half. So for 30 seconds to 90 seconds. And so that might mean you're doing five or six reps slowly. It's not about the number, it's about the time in which you are completely contracted. And so I've measured this on the CGM and you'll find that you've induced a blood sugar spike, which is fine, which, which correlates to inducing a growth hormone spike, which is also fine. And then, it, of course, it comes down an hour, a couple hours later. Your growth hormone comes down a couple hours later, but your glucose comes back down pretty quickly. So having that intensity is really important. And so if you go to the gym and you're just doing you know, three reps of 10, so on and so forth, it's better than nothing. Absolutely better than nothing. High intensity exercise is way better than that. And another thing you can do externally is making sure your, if you want to do a blood work, I'm all about blood work and data. Have you noticed? Is your omega panel. So you really do want to get your omega six to omega three ratio to about a three to one. So there's, there is more omega six, which naturally is going to be arachidonic acid. And you get all the contrived industrial oils out of your diet, right? Like the corn and the soy and the canola and the safflower. Just get rid of them. And if you did that, you would be firmly, pretty much impervious to a seasonal affecting disorder. But it does require some work. So I did get into polymorphism sets. I find that very interesting. And that's been doing that about seven years now. It's just part of what we do. It's part of looking at people. Uh, The CGM Ask your doc for that. You should, and I think you can buy it in some states just over the counter, regardless. Like Connecticut, you can just walk in and get it. Not in North Carolina. I don't know what the holdup is there. And you got your vitamin D, K2 with magnesium, and you drop the carbs. So I expect anybody who feels that they have been doing or, or been had a life that they were encumbered with seasonal affecting disorder and they just sort of stopped their life for a couple months. No need to do that. Do not. And also, of course, you seek professional help if you just can't do this. But these are things that I didn't know before med school, and the list got longer after med school. And I live by these, and this is absolutely uh, what helps me. So right now, um, we're in the North Carolina winter, so it's now late evening, so it's dark outside, and I have full spectrum lights, and it is tremendously helpful. I'm up my vitamin D, K2. I haven't done the CGM for a while. I did all that before, so I kind of know what's up. We do, I do take my omega-3s. So I hope that has been something to listen to. I hope this is actionable information. And uh, I might come back, circle back around 
this in talking about depression in general, either by profession and other things that can be done. Uh, Because I think that depression is really not talked about enough. And I think uh, mental disorders relative to mitochondria, relative to nutrition, relative to uh, genomic predispositions are not talked about enough in with the perspective of that they can be addressed. So who cares you check these things, but they can be addressed and you're finding things that you can do that can completely change somebody's life. So I hope you believe that. I hope you take it to heart. And until next time, take care. Hi, this is Dr. Goldcamp. I just wanted to encourage you to send in your questions to Dr. Goldcamp at ketonaturopath.com. Many of you have, and so what I've done with these questions that I've gotten back to most of the people I email, but some of the questions that were so good, and if they were overlapping to other questions, I would combine them and try to put that into the topic of a podcast, either via one of the micro topics that are covered in an interview. As you know, we cover a lot of topics in any given interview or some of my own sort of reporting, if you will, on some of these issues. So please keep the questions coming. Feel free to send in an email and uh, I will get back to you. Stay listening. Send